Welcome back to part three of this Let's Play of Might and Magic 6. Let's get right into it. Okay, so uh, between the last episode and this one, uh, I did a bit of stuff. I sort of wandered around town a bit, did a bit of menial stuff, uh, skilled up a bit, got some more, uh, some more equipment, and I wandered around killing a lot of stuff in the overworld. So I've cleared the areas of the map that I can easily reach um, in the new Sorbigal area, but it's all you know, very tedious, you didn't really miss much, and I thought rather than go through it all on uh, on on, um, on camera, well, i just get it all out of the way. So I've come back down into these caves behind the abandoned temple, uh, where we were at the last time, and we'll just carry on down here uh, for a while. Uh, no one's leveled up. Um, I have um, I have skilled everyone up in, in, in their bow skill. Ooh, over here. Uh, nothing I can tell. Um, I've skilled everyone up to uh, a, a, a four in bow, which uh, which means um, that, well, that's as high as I can take them until I fi find an expert trainer for them. Um, which there isn't one in the map, as far as I can see. Uh, that's gonna be, we've got to go elsewhere for that. So that's sort of a, a big midterm goal. Um, is to carry on uh, training everyone up in, in, in bow because they've reached a, a cap to how good they can be at the moment. Let's see how much of these th things we can... Well, if we just keep some distance between us and them, we might be okay. Uh, and we might not be able to get hit at all. We might be able to avoid any risk at all to our party. Um, one of the things in this game... Uh, that is, is, is very uh, very noticeable. It's just the sheer numbers of enemies. Um, <clears throat> it's not a it's not a small number of challenging encounters. It's a large number of um, extremely easy ones. Okay, we've got snakes coming in as well, or at least in these early stages it is. I don't want to speak for uh, what may come later because I really don't know. Okay, so while we um, sort of dive down into this, I'm going to try something uh, a little different, and I'm going to try and um, uh, sort of talk about something a little, uh, uh, a sort of related subject while I play, rather than just give a play-by-play, -play, which is pretty tedious. Um, I wanted to talk about the, the story of the publisher of this game, um, uh, 3DO. So I'm going to try and do that, and let's see how um, how capable of multitasking I am. This could be a completely awful idea, um, but if I can play and um, talk coherently, it may actually work. Let's let's give it a try. So um, 3DO uh, is is a is a name that you may know um, from something else. You may know them as a you you may know the 3DO as a console. Uh, and indeed, that's how the that's how the company started uh, in the in the in the early to mid nineties. Um, they had this idea to create a console. This is sort of the SNES era, the SNES and and uh, Mega Drive era. They had this idea to um, to create a console, um, but they were going to use an unusual um, business model for this because three DO never made hardware. They weren't a hardware manufacturer. Instead, what they did is they licensed the design of the 3DO console to other manufacturers to produce. And the idea was that you would be able to go into a shop and you would be able to choose between, you know, the the, the Panasonic 3DO and the, you know, the Sharp 3DO and stuff like this. Um, and they would compete against one another on, um, on features, on price. Um, and... Games would be, you know, they they would get a profit through 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 games. Every game would um, would run on every 3DO. So it was kind of like the it was an interesting standards based approach. It was kind of like DVD players, I, I suppose, except they were controlling this the, the spec. So they came up with the spec and they got a few. It kind of worked, and they they, they got a, f a couple of a handful of manufacturers interested in making 3DOs. Um. Panasonic was the was the big one, and at least in the West, um, they they got a couple of others. Um, in fact, at, at at one point, you could even buy Creative Labs sold a 3DO card that you could put in your PC and uh, play 3DO games on that through uh, load them off the 
off the CD-ROM and it would just entirely emulate a 3D on, on, on the board, uh, which is an interesting idea. Um, but there was a real problem with this with this scheme, unfortunately. And it's something they really should have been able to anticipate but didn't. Uh, and that is this. The normal business model for consoles is that they um, sell the consoles at either a loss or a very low margin. And they make up their, their profit on the games that are going to be bought uh, by the customer over the lifetime of the console. Uh, because the, 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 there's a there's a licensing cut on every game that's sold. You know, you buy an Xbox game now, and Microsoft are getting a certain amount of that, no matter who has developed the game. Um, so they can sell at a loss, and that's been the case for pretty much. Uh, I, I, that, that's a fairly standard thing to do. I think Nintendo don't do that. I've got a feeling that Nintendo always sell at a slight profit. Um, but certainly, uh, Microsoft and I think Sony have sold consoles consoles at a loss. Um, so that's the normal thing, and that keeps the price of a console cheap, um, or relatively cheap. But for the 3DO, there's an issue with how they structured it, because if you're Panasonic and you're um, making, a, making a 3DO device, as they did, well... All your profit is going to come from the sale of the machine because you aren't going to see anything else from the sale of games. That'll just go to the 3DO company and the developer. So, if you're Panasonic, you have to factor in the costs of developing and making that machine and the licensing costs that you're going to pay to 3DO for doing it. And then you have to put some sort of a margin in there so you're making a profit on the deal. You can't sell at a loss. So this is why the 3DO, when it was first launched, uh, launched with a price tag in the US of $700. And that's a lot of money today, but this was in 1993. Um, to give you some perspective on that, you could buy three and a half Super Nintendo Entertainment Systems for that. Um, it, it was an absolutely ludicrous uh, price tag for a machine. And they tried to pitch it as... Um, you know, a serious machine, a high-end machine. Of course, they had no option other than to do that. Uh, they, they, their marketing uh, really revolved around, um, you know, the, the 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 Sega and Nintendo machines were toys. This was, you know, this was a, a system, a gaming system. This was the real thing. Uh, but it didn't really work. It was seven hundred dollars. And you know there were there were other reasons for for the failure of the system. Um, that that was certainly the main one. Uh, I mean, just just some ridiculous stuff. I mean, the the, the launch lineup for the console was one game. Um, I'll say that again. The launch lineup was one game, and by all accounts, it was a pretty mediocre game. Um, so there were a whole load of factors conspiring. F to uh, make the it, it was a it was a very flawed business model. It, we really never had a chance of succeeding. Um, to to uh, to make a, 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 an ambitious and uh, an expensive machine and then have to sell it at a profit um, was not something that was going to be affordable to most people. The Atari Jaguar came out the same year. That was $250. We're talking $700 here. It's just way out of the price range of, of most people. So uh, really the, the, the console was and is really to this day one of the biggest failures um, uh, in, in, in video gaming history. Um, but somehow miraculously 3DO the company um, stays around um, after this. Okay, so they've they, they, their consoles failed, but somehow they're still solvent. Uh, and what happened next was that they pivoted their business model and they decided to become a publisher. Uh, and that's sort of where we come in here. This was one of their first games, Might Magic 6. They bought New World Computing, the developer of Might Magic. Uh, and a couple of other games as well, uh, uh, game developers as well. Uh, and they got into uh, they got into game publishing, and well, it started off pretty pretty well. There were really no issues with this. Might Magic Six uh, 
is certainly uh, one of the more, well, certainly a, a, probably the most ambitious title in the series, um, and definitely the, mo the the one with the biggest technical technological advance between the previous part and this part. Um, how much of that was 3D? Oh, I don't know. Uh, how much was new, new world computing? I, I, I'm not sure how long it had been in development when the acquisition happened. But this game came out under 3DO and it was a critical success and a pretty good commercial success too, uh, as far as I can fi uh, find out. Um, but then uh, things started to go sort of sour with 3DO. You see, um, New World Computing had been a company that had uh, been operating as, as an independent business for like 10 years. Uh, the Might and Magic games had all been designed by the same guy, uh, John Van Kennegan. Um and it was it was a, a, a business that was really driven by uh, by creativity. And then 3DO came in, and it was a it was a, a massive culture shock to the people at New World Computing because suddenly a company comes in uh, that is very much driven by sales and money, and this is pretty much standard for the studio system now but at the time it felt like a a, 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 a really ridiculous um, a, a ridiculous setup the, the the decisions were all being made by the head of sales uh, they who was who was deciding you know what um, games were being developed making sales projections based on um, uh, um, which which would dictate the budgets of games um, there was no real creative uh, element to the decision making at all. It was entirely uh, money driven, uh, and that came as a huge shock. Uh, more than that, they insisted on the release of a new Might and Magic game uh, every year. So this came out in 1998. Might and Magic Seven comes out in 1998. Uh, Nine. Uh, Might and Magic Eight comes out in 2000, etc. Uh, that is a tight schedule for a business. Well, this series averaged um, one game uh, every uh, more than two years up to this uh, up to the point of the 3DO acquisition, and suddenly they're having to make one every year. So that's a a, a dramatically reduced um, development cycle, and it really showed in the in the quality of the the output as well. I mean this. Um, this game and, and, and arguably seven really were kind of the high point. Eight really just felt very rushed. Uh, a number of reviewers pointed out that there's the amount of recycled content in eight, and it's because they were rushing to meet a deadline. Um, they didn't put out a game in 2001. Uh, Might and Magic 9 came out in the, early the next year. Uh, but it was a complete mess. Uh, it was an obviously unfinished game, and I think this was, you know, ba you know, b basically entirely due to the HBO politics and the internal, you know, pressure to release quickly. Um, the 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 uh, lead designer of that game was uh, was quoted as saying that it needed six more work, uh, six more months of work before it was even releasable. Um, Unfortunately, they never even got the chance to put that right because about a month after the release of Might and Magic 9, um, 3DO were in really dire financial difficulties by this point, uh, fired most of the staff of New World Computing. Uh, uh, so it never really saw the patch and the, after the, the, you know, the, the support that it needed in order to you know, achieve the potential of that game. I think there have been fan efforts to patch it. But I don't know how you know how complete they are. Um, so uh, a few months later, um, 3DO themselves filed for bankruptcy, and uh, that was really the end of it. Um, they they sold off uh, their intellectual property to various bidders. Might and Magic, the 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 IP for Might and Magic, ended up with going to Ubisoft. Uh, and they've released games since, but they rebooted the franchise. Basically, there's there's very little in common, um, other than the name uh, between the uh, New World Computing Magic's and the Ubisoft ones. 
Um, so they, you know, they really should be. They really need to be treated as as, as two franchises that happen to share a name due to various, you know, uh, business shenanigans that happened. I'm not making a value judgment on Ubisoft's games, they're just, but they're simply not set in the same universe. Uh, ooh, I think we probably need to avoid that snake a little bit. He looked quite big. So that was the end of uh, 3DO, and that was the, uh, also the end of um, the end of Might and Magic for a while. Uh, uh, yeah, a, a lot of this information came from an interview in an old um, 2004 issue of Computer Gaming World. Uh, with John Van Kennegan, the um, the creator of Might and Magic and the lead designer of the first eight games, uh, he was none too impressed with uh, how 3D had had handled things. Uh, really, part of the course now, I think, in, in AAA game development. But he seemed uh, extremely nonplussed uh, at the idea of uh, sales projections being the deciding factor for uh, decisions of, of game development so yeah so that's the that's the brief story of of, of 3d uh, it is a shame that they they went the way they did uh, it I, I, I don't really have a lot good to say about you know things that they did right it's it's difficult to uh, well they did give us Four Might and Magic games that we would have never had. Uh, um, John Van Kennegan says that without 3DO, uh, New World Computing would have ceased to exist a lot earlier. So they did, you know, they give the company a reprieve, I suppose. Uh, it, it, it's, it is said. But a terrible business model for a console that was one of the biggest commercial failures ever seen. Um... Uh, followed by uh, some, well, Got it. mismanagement maybe is too strong a word, but certainly, um, certainly the quality you can see a, a a considerable, I think, quality dip. Where the heck am I? Am I getting lost? Okay, right. I don't know where all those snakes came from, but let's put some distance between us and them. Um, there is certainly a, a distinctive quality dip after six and seven. Uh, 8 was mediocre at best, and 9 was this horrible, buggy, unfinished mess. Uh, and I think uh, in, in both cases it was down to accelerated, uh, unsustainable production schedules um, that was uh, that were imposed on them by, by their new management. Uh, yeah, so so that's, that's 3DO. Yeah. Uh, I, I I hope that digression was interesting. We have not got pretty much anywhere close to the end of any of these passageways and tunnels. Uh, it seems that we are in a place that is, well, absolutely epically huge. Um, but I'm quite glad I didn't have to give a play by, by play on this because I don't think it would have been all that interesting. Oh, come on, just give me a dead end or something I can double back from in some case. Just don't keep opening up the... the map. Please. Oops, okay. Well, this this bow strategy is, is working okay. I mean, we've done... we've taken very little damage. We haven't been poisoned. We've kept everything at a good distance. I think this is a good uh, way to work our way through lots of cannon fodder. Uh, I dread to think how slow and... Um, tedious this might have been had we not uh, given everyone bows. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, this is definitely the strategy to go for, I think. Uh, back up a little bit. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So we're just getting a little gold and stuff off these corpses. They're not really doing a whole lot for us in terms of items or anything. I suppose we can XP as well. Uh, let's see. Hopefully this is a dead end down here. Got it. Never actually seen a 3DO in the wild for what it's worth. Uh, actually, the console, I think, was called the 3DO... Uh, 
3D on multimedia interactive something. Uh, <laughs> no, um, I, I, I've never even heard of anyone who's ever owned one. Uh, they were released in Europe, I'm pretty sure. But um, uh, they, I think they were as much of a, uh, of a commercial failure here as, as elsewhere. They didn't. They didn't. Uh, they weren't always seven hundred dollars. Uh, by the way, there was another manufacturer came in uh, after a year or two and made um, a cheaper version. I think it was Gold Star. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure the Panasonic came down in price as well. But I've never heard. Um, talk of a single sort of must play title on the 3DO. Um, they had a number of exclusives, but I think it was just sort of that era of um, gaming where there was just not a whole lot of... Uh, well, everyone was catching up with 3D, I suppose, uh, is, is maybe the best way to say it. Um, so it's, I think it was just that time of... Yeah, Eggs, interesting. I think it was just that time of the um, of the sort of historical cycle where everyone's trying to do things that are fancy, and not a lot of people are trying to do things that are innovative or interesting. Uh, okay, eggs. Well, I don't know quite what we had to do with these, but we also have chest over here. Let's go in there. Uh, Got it. Yep, okay, we disarmed it. Great, we got some gold. Another broadsword. Uh hammer we can't identify. Hmm. I don't know. A wand we can't identify. Cheap dagger know. and an unidentifiable cloak. And then hopefully down this corridor or something we reach some sort of a dead end, so at least we'll be able to close off one um oops, one, one sort of arm of this um of this tremendous sprawling cave system. Got that one. So at least we feel like rather than uh, uh, what's in front of us just uh, continually increasing, uh, we're at least reducing the options uh, and getting somewhere close to clearing out this place. Uh, for what it's worth, um, I, I mentioned Ubisoft. They did release earlier this year uh, a new Might and Magic game. I mean, they've been releasing Heroes games, but they released Might and Magic 10. Uh, which kind of flew under my radar. I mean, I've got a history with Might and Magic, and I didn't know this existed until I started doing the research for these videos. Um, but it is um, a, a sort of old-school... Uh, tile-based, is that what you call it? The, 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 a sort of tile grid map. Um, where you move in, in increments on a square grid. Uh, RPG, very old school, like kind of Legend of Grimrock. Uh, of course, nothing, no story relationship at all with these first nine games, uh, which are all tied together in the same universe in varying levels of, uh, w w varying levels of tightness. Um, some games are direct sequels to one another, others only really have the most um, sort of uh, weakly implied links uh, to the, that even place them in the same uh, in the same universe. But Ten is a is a game uh, completely on its on, on its own. Um, I've heard that even though it was a budget game, and it feels like a budget game, there's a lot of uh, asset reuse from earlier. Uh, earlier games, uh, um, heroes games and things. I've heard that it's actually pretty decent. Uh, and I quite like to play it uh, sometime. But yeah, really no relationship to these games at all. Save the name. Okay, we're actually getting almost somewhere. It looks as though there's a big chamber down here, but let's see. There we go. We're doing pretty well here. This is working out. Uh, well, this is just a tunnel. Oh no, it opens up into a big room there. I want to save, I think. Whoops. 
Oh yeah, okay. We do not want to take on that giant spider and with melee. Okay. Well, how long have I been talking? Uh, if we're at almost at sort of um, 20 minutes or so, I probably want to wrap this up, but let's get to a, a point where we've cleared out this chamber first, maybe. There we go. Okay, assuming there's a chamber and not some hub of like eight tunnels or something which would fit um, the pattern. We do have some stuff to go back to town for, and oh, our wizard eyes ran out. I didn't think there was anything coming for us there. Turns out, just can't see it. I guess we lie. La la. Ah, we go. Poisoned. Damn it. Well, okay, we're definitely coming back to town after this then, but let's see if this is just one big room, see if there's any loot in it, and we'll call it there. I can't really see, and I don't think that I have any sort of a spell for light either. So let's see. There's something somewhere. Oh, it's there. And we got another one that's poisoned now. And this, ooh, queen spider again. Let's run away. Yeah, hopefully this spider's lair has something worth fighting for. Okay. So yeah, one of the things that I haven't done in this game really is uh, is is build out any further from my initial um, loadout of, of of different spells. I think we need to make that a priority because. This room, despite the presence of this one torch or something, I really can't see a whole lot in. I mean, there's, oh, I did, I got that excellent. I saw that there was something there on the radar. Oh, well, we have um, some sort of a door here. Let's save. And take a look. Okay. Well, this is a trap if ever I saw one. Mm. Okay, well, let's just go for it. Let's see. Get some gold there. There are stars. I see stars. Mm. Let's see. Got it. Huh. Okay, and oh. what we have are some gauntlets that we can't know. see what they are, a wand we can't see know. what it is, and a dagger we can't see what it is. Great. And um, no trap. Oh. Another, for another wand. Great, well that seems a good place then uh, to curtail our explorations for now. I will dash back to town, but I'm going to wrap up the video here uh, and do all that um, off uh, offline. I see no need to uh, be any more boring than the last episode already was. So, um, thanks for watching. Uh, I'm going to leave it there, and I'll see you in the next episode.